Welcome to the Bible Exegete, the place where we dive and delve deep into the Word of God. My name is Benny Cruchero, I am a pastor, and today I'll be your host. In a previous video, we talked about the Epistle to the Hebrews, its date and audience especially. We covered a little bit about the context as well, but today we will talk more in detail about the context of the epistle and just a little about the author, which we'll cover in a future video. As I said in our previous video, there were two major events happening at the same time in the 60s, the Neronian persecution and the Roman Jewish war. And these two major events shaped the face of Christianity and of Judaism. We need to understand the timeline of the Roman Jewish War to understand the context of our epistle and what was happening with the Jewish people. We know from Flavius Josephus that Jesius Florus was elected as a procurator in 64. And he did not know how to deal with the Jewish people. He was harsh, he lacked diplomacy, and put a lot of pressure on the people. He wasn't the right person at the right time. In 63, the temple renovations were finished, and a lot of people lost their jobs. The country wasn't doing too well financially. And therefore, especially when Jesus Flores came to power, a lot of the Jews decided to move and go abroad to look for better financial means. As this was happening, Rome was burned down in July 64. Not the whole city, but 10 districts out of 14 were burned, and three of them were completely burned down. That put a lot of pressure on the whole Roman Empire as now the emperor Nero and its leadership were looking for money to renovate, to rebuild Rome. And because of this, a lot of pressure was put on other regions of the Roman Empire, including Judea. They were asking for more and more money to rebuild Rome, the eternal city. As this was happening, although initially Nero was seen favorable, after a while, people started gossiping and saying that it was him who burned down Rome. Because of this, Nero had to find a scapegoat. And the perfect scapegoats were the Christians. Everybody hated them. Nobody liked them. In this context, the persecution against the Christian starts. Most likely in the beginning was probably more in Rome, but then it extended and it got to the edges of the empire as well. In the meantime, that pressure I was talking about for money so that Rome would be rebuilt puts a lot of pressure on Judea as well, added to their difficulties from a financial point of view. Florus ends up robbing the temple in 66, probably early 66. And this is the spark, the trigger for the Jewish-Roman War. The rebellion starts with the Sicarii in August 66, and then Florus is taken down, and the Romans send an army to siege Jerusalem. This happens in October 66. This siege fails badly, very badly for the Roman reputation. Therefore, the Romans flee in November 66. We know from the scripture, from Christ's words in Matthew 24, that this would be coming. Jerusalem will be sieged, and then the siege will stop, and the Christians will have an opportunity to flee. So the Christians do exactly that. They flee. A lot of Christians flee starting with November 66. Now, the Jews thought this as a victory, and they got encouraged, and they thought this was the perfect time to fight the Romans. They didn't have anything to lose. They weren't doing well financially. The people were just wanting to have the opportunity to work their own lands and win their own bread. And in this context, a lot of Christians flee. I also mentioned that Nero dies in June 68, when I believe that the persecution ended, at least somewhere around there. We know that the Christians flee, which I think is one of the most important factors from church history. Eusebius tells us that they went to the city of Pella, which was east of the Jordan River. 
But they didn't stay there. The war continued and most likely a lot of the Christians went to other areas and other regions of the Roman Empire where they could have a better life, where they could work and integrate in a good community. And what did a good community mean? Well, first of all, they were Jewish and secondly, they were Christians. So they had to look for Jewish and Christian communities. The best context would be some of these cities, Alexandria, somewhere in Parthia, which was a different empire at that time. So I don't know how much this would fit. Antioch in Syria or Asia Minor. The largest Jewish Christian community was in Asia Minor. Ephesus was one of these cities. But obviously there were many other cities in other regions uh, like Galatia and so on where they could have gone. They had friends there. They had relatives there. And we know from church history that at least after 70 AD, once the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, we have important figures like John going to Ephesus. We know he spent his latter part of the life in Ephesus. So if you have one important leader going to Ephesus, you have all kind of people following him. Some of them might not even be Christians. They go with the other people looking for a better life. Something similar to what happened with the Exodus. You also had Egyptians going with them. But that's just another discussion. You have a large influx of Jewish Christians in Asia Minor. Ephesus would be the biggest and probably the best city to live in. They probably had relatives there, like I said, friends, people they knew. The problem is, yes, they were Christians, but they didn't interact with the Christian diaspora. They didn't have to see them living their lives differently from the way they thought they were living. They weren't circumcised. They didn't respect the law of Moses. And it's one to know they are somewhere out there and we have our own little community here and we live by our rules, they live by their rules. And it's another thing when you start interacting. So I believe this is the context in which the epistle to the Hebrews was written. There was a big influx of Jewish Christians from Jerusalem and Judea going into Asia Minor. And they see their relatives, their friends, they see the Gentiles not living how they thought they should live. Somewhat of a similar dilemma to the book of Galatians. In this context, they start talking more and more about going back to their Jewish roots, to getting circumcised, to respecting the law more and more, as they're seeing their relatives, their friends that have been living there for a lifetime or more. There were generations that were born in that diaspora not respecting the law of Moses. And this is the context in which the author needs to write the epistle. It's addressed to Ephesus or the churches in Asia Minor. They know who he is. He knows who they are. He knows the Christian Jewish community that came from Jerusalem. And he also knows the Gentile Christian community in Asia Minor. And there is a need for this epistle to settle things down, to tell them not to go back to the law of Moses. It might not have been quitting Christianity for some of them. For some, it might have been quitting Christianity. But he is seeing this as giving up on Christ, going back to the circumcision, going back to the law of Moses. Knowing the context, we should think about the author and... I made a list of the proposed authors, the people I found mentioned as possible authors. There are some names in this list that make no sense, like Timothy, like Stephen, but I still have their names up there. In our future video, we will cover the possible authors, and from this whole list, only three names will stand. And from three names, I think we have good arguments. To pick one main name and I will tell you why I say one main name we will compare the epistle to the Hebrews to first Peter for a little 
and we have good clues from this comparison as well. If you enjoyed this material, please like it, please subscribe, and I look forward to hearing your questions and hearing about your ideas regarding what I said in this video. Thank you very much for watching the Bible Exegete.